Listening to the flip side with Noah Philippiak, connecting the reality of the gospel to the grid of life. You can support the podcast and pick up some sweet flip side swag at www.patreon.com slash Noah Philippiak. What is up, Flip Upon Am I? Welcome to episode 96 of the Flip Side Podcast. Got an exciting interview today with Drew Boa. And just a heads up for listeners, if you're listening in your car or maybe in your kitchen or something and your kids are around, this is not going to be a a uh, kid-level episode. We're going to talk about, you know, pornography and uh, some addiction stuff. And and so just uh, give you a heads up. You want to listen to this one um, without kids around. And so speaking of kids, though, not really kids, but teenagers, I want to give you a heads up. I mentioned this in episode 95, but I have a new book out called Needed Navigation, a teen guy or girl's guide to their identity in Christ in a porn and sex filled world. And highly encourage you to check that out. Uh, it's a great way also to support the podcast uh, if you're a, if you're a regular listener. Uh, but honestly, I'm just asking you to pick up a copy for any youth pastors that you know in your life. I think it will be a great resource for youth groups. It is for guys and for girls. There is small group questions included in the book, and they're meant to be very approachable. Uh, pick up a copy for youth pastors that you know, youth leaders that you know. Also, if you have teens in your life, if you have your own children, I recommend it for ages 13 through 18. And so pick a copy up. It's a short book. I wrote it short on purpose. Uh, It turned out to be about 75 pages in the published book, but it's really only about 60 pages uh, of the actual manuscript. Uh, I want teens to be able to read it and access it, but it is just so, so important that teens have some navigation when it comes to pornography and sex today. Uh, it's, it's, it's really an irony because we all know how immersed in technology uh, kids and teens are. We all know how prolific pornography is today. And, and uh, just on these social media apps, TikTok, and it's, there's, there's hardcore porn. And then there's all kinds of, uh, I don't even like the term softer porn, you know, like all kinds of just sexualized, sex-saturated stuff that kids are getting shown over and over and over again. And so I really, really believe in this resource. And again, it's called Needed Navigation uh, by Noah Flipiak. You can pick it up uh, anywhere online uh, that books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, ebook is out there as well as a paperback version. And uh, so today, uh, let me read you Drew's bio here in a moment. Um, But we've just had some really great conversations on the flip side recently. Last episode, talked to Dr. Carol, and we were talking through, uh, you know, marriages that that are sexless um, and and kind of guys going into marriage uh, with a lot of entitlement around sex. And Drew and I get into that a little bit uh, today as well. But then also uh, just the, the, the in the interview with Dr. Carol last episode, talking through the the need to develop intimacy within a marriage so that uh, both a husband and a wife want to have sex. There's so many times in Christian marriages where uh, a wife has been taught so many negative things about sex, and often her husband is pushing negative things about sex onto her that she just doesn't want to have sex at all, and then that creates other issues in the marriage. And so these conversations are really in these these ministries are really related. Um, even the material in Beyond the Battle, it's related to all that stuff in the Dr. Carroll interview. It's related to all the stuff in uh, Drew's ministry today. So just really encourage you not to try to fix this stuff alone, to reach out, to know there's help, to know there's people like Drew, there's people like Dr. Carroll, uh, myself as well, uh, that want to walk with you uh, in your singleness, walk with you uh, in your marriage uh, so to find to find true uh, true and lasting freedom. So let me give a shout out to Five Lakes Angry Brew. I'm drinking my Chris's Blend today. Uh, big shout out for sponsoring the podcast. Encourage you to pick up a bag of Angry Brew, twice the caffeine of normal coffee or Chris's Blend. 
a dollar. Uh, it's a Honduran blend, and a dollar of your of your purchase goes to an orphanage in Honduras. You can use promo code FLIP to get 10% off your order at fivelakes.com or angrybrew.com. Let me read Drew's bio to you, and then we will jump into this interview uh, with Drew Boa. Uh, and we're going to be talking about trauma and about, again, if, if pornography may not be your issue. Um, and let me say this too before I read his interview. Uh, Drew's ministry is specifically to men. So the context of our conversation is around men looking at pornography. Uh, but please know, uh, I, I want to uh, recognize that many, many women are also struggling with pornography. It just tends uh, pornography addiction, um, struggles with porn, as well as sex addiction stuff, it tends to be uh, a safer environment uh, to for men to be working with men and women to be working with women. Uh, I want to refer you back to an uh, interview I did with Crystal Renaud Day. On the flip side, I will pull that episode number up here in a moment. Uh, but Crystal's ministry is sherecovery.com. And um, you can, it's episode 88, so just a handful of episodes ago, you can check out my interview with Crystal. Uh, if you're a woman who's looking at porn, I highly recommend you to get connected into her community uh, over there. But again, even if porn's not your issue, if uh, sex, sexual sin stuff is not your issue, there's still so many, we're in the same boat uh, when it comes to getting our needs met in Jesus and our needs met in embodied community. And we all have needs. We all have ways we're trying to get our needs for validation and approval met. And so I'd encourage you still to listen to this episode uh, as it's going to guide you to gospel truths um, about about how to find peace in Jesus, how to get your needs met in Jesus. And I also think it's helpful to grow in empathy for the men and women who do struggle with uh, pornography issues and sexual sin issues uh, and to be a safe person for them uh, to be able to talk to. So I'll read you Drew's um, bio, which I just had on my screen, and there it's back because <laughs> I was I was finding Crystal's episode. Uh, let me read you Drew's bio, and then we will uh, jump into the interview. Drew Boa is the founder of Husband Material, where he helps men outgrow pornography. As a pastoral sex addiction professional, PSAP, Drew has worked with hundreds of men healing all kinds of sexual brokenness. Drew is the author of Redeemed Sexuality and host of the Husband Material podcast. Drew lives in Colorado Springs, Colorado with his wife and three kids. His favorite activity is trail running. Uh, you can check more out from Drew at husbandmaterial.com, and much of the material that we're going to cover today uh, you can find at healyourtrauma.com, where you can pick up Drew's free 10 Ways to Heal Your Trauma resource. All right, here we go. All right, Drew, welcome to The Flip Side. We are glad to have you. It's good to be here, man. Drew, my whole life I've gotten jokes about Noah. I still get them. People ask me like, "Where's your ark?" And I'm, I go, "I'm 41." Like, good one. Like, I've never heard that before. So I got to ask you, your name. First of all, your last name is Boa. It's awesome. Um, how many Boa Constrictor references do you get on like a, I don't know, a monthly or annual basis? I get a few Boa Constrictor comments. Also, feather Boa. Oh, come on. That's that's a low blow. Boa Constrictor, yeah. way cooler. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I right. Well, definitely wanted to make sure that none of my sons are named Noah. Yeah, I was going to say, no, that was my next question. You need to name one of your children <laughs> after me would be great. And then his name would be Noah Boa, which would be awesome. It's like an automatic. <laughs> he'd be like a WWE wrestler or something automatically just based on his name. Either that or he just goes through horrible bullying. <laughs> yeah. With or the both. name no, Noah. Maybe, maybe that's his redemption story. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> that's so funny. All right. Well, uh, you start talking about um, horrible bullying, and it already kind of puts us into the space of storytelling. We'll, I'll transition from my my corny joke into our, our, our real conversation here. Um, man, I know um, whenever I talk about 
anything regarding porn, anything regarding sexual sin. I always like to share my story up front um, because I think it's really important that we just bring grace into the room. And uh, we're going to talk some about trauma today. And so bullying, you know, that that brings that up. It brings up this I, this uh, one of the ways trauma can come into our childhood. But, uh, you know, just can you share with listeners uh most of my listeners won't have heard your story before. Uh, just kind of a concise, um, I know it's hard to do in a concise way, but as, as much as you feel comfortable um, going with it, just kind of your story and when it comes to sexual sin and then um, kind of uh, how you got to where you are today. I was a boy who fell in love with Jesus and also had this super strong attachment to porn that I hated and couldn't stop specifically a sexual fetish for braces really kept me trapped. I mean, even after I had over a year of freedom from the behavior of going to porn and masturbating, that fetish and fantasy was still lurking in the shadows and it still had so much power over me. And and after I relapsed after a year, I thought, gosh, is it ever going to end? Um, or am I in this battle for the rest of my life? That took me to a deeper journey into my childhood and realizing where that attachment, where that fetish really started, where it came from and broke down some of the self-hatred that I felt. Mm -hmm. That was the first time I really felt grace and acceptance for my specific particular type of porn struggle. And that's what has led me into a much longer term freedom where I feel like I am beyond the battle. I mean, yes, it's a struggle sometimes, mm -hmm. but it's, it's not me fighting my sexuality. It's me befriending these parts of me, especially befriending the little boy who was first exploited by porn. Mm. Yeah, talk about that a little more, you know, the self-hatred part. I think we all can relate to those that are struggle with any addiction, those that are struggling with porn addiction. There's this, uh, why can't I stop this? Or I'm disgusting, you know, this sorts of things. How did uncovering, uh, kind of going back to your childhood, um, how, how did that help you with the, the self-hatred piece? It just made so much more sense. So for my specific fetish, braces, what does that remind me of? Where does that take me back to in my life? Well, middle school. Mm -hmm. And really the worst time of my life was middle school. I mean, that's probably true for many of us. But for me, it was much more extreme. And in that place, I hit puberty at the same time as I was going through the deepest grief uh, that I'd ever had. I lived in Canada, moved to Texas. If you've ever seen the movie Inside Out with the little girl Riley, like that was me. That was my story. And, and during that time, I really withdrew into my bedroom with the door locked. Looking at porn, playing video games. That's where it all started for me. Now, the roots of this specific fetish actually go back a lot further than that. But just at first validating like, oh, there's a story yeah. behind my sexual thoughts and feelings. It's not random. I wasn't born this way. There, there's not like an identity attached to it. Like, oh, this is who I am. No, this is what happened to me. This is how my brain and body found a way to survive and and to get through that time of life. And, and those images and videos imprinted from a very early age. And I think this is really important for anybody who's struggling with porn. When did you first get introduced? When did you first get exposed? For most of us, we were just boys. Mm -hmm. Heal the boy to free the man. Mm, that's so good. Yeah, yeah. And what do you mean by the phrase you, uh, rather than battling your sexuality, because often guys, you know, call it a battle. 
Uh, and there's, you know, even my book sort of a play on words beyond the battle. And, yeah. and, and I, and I, I get where the, where the phrase comes from of battling. Um, but we can talk about that. I, I, I think, um, but w when you could, you contrast that to befriending your sexuality, um, I, I think some listeners may have no idea what you're talking about, mm -hmm. uh, or might, might have a wrong idea of what you're talking about. What do you, what do you mean by befriending your sexuality and why is that a part of the the healing process? Let's say you get a really strong sexual attraction or urge not just thinking oh that person looks good but it feels irresistible it has a magnetic pull on you what do you do in that moment for most guys it's some variation of attack it avoid it ignore it even if that's using some kind of spiritual strategy like i'm gonna pray read the bible call a friend I mean, none of those things are bad, but when they're used to resist, it actually intensifies the urge. Mm. I mean, science has shown this. What we resist persists. And this is why when you when you have a, a triggering moment like that, like if I saw somebody with braces, like if if I'm in that attack, avoid, ignore mode. In other words, fight, flight, freeze, a trauma mm -hmm. reaction. Yeah. If if I'm in that place, that can just snowball. And I could be dealing with this for hours. I could just feel like it's getting bigger and bigger until I can't handle it anymore. I just have to find a relief. So that is the cycle that so many of us are trapped in. Not realizing there's another way. Mm. Instead of fighting or fleeing we can actually face these feelings and find out, well, I wonder where that's coming from. Yeah. And I wonder what part of me is feeling this. What is the deeper desire underneath the attraction for acceptance, affirmation, affection, connection, intimacy, um, there are so many, so many good God given desires and we unwittingly repress them when all we do is try to fight against those surface level sensations. But when we can go deeper, we can find what really what God created us for and then meet those unmet needs. That's a, that's a much deeper and more lasting approach to freedom. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. Was it you and your writing? I'm not sure. Like, tell me if it was, and if not, maybe I don't know where I got this from. Uh, that talked about porn being because you talk about um, I forget the phrase you use. Growing up, uh, grow grow outgrowing porn. Right? Is that kind of that's a right. phrase you use? Okay. So that phrase actually came from Robert Masters. Okay. In his book to be a man. So, but the analogy that I remembered was porn as like a pacifier or a teddy bear, something like that. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. Yep. And porn he just a showed a pacifier for those of you not watching on YouTube. So yeah. Yeah. Good. I mean, this is an adult pacifier. They really do exist. That is huge. I was going to say, it's hard to tell with the, the, the camera, but I'm like, that's not a child's like that no. thing's mess. Okay. Keep going. And it's a really powerful way to understand what is happening for adults who have this pattern that we picked up as little mm -hmm. kids. It's a souvenir from adolescence. Mm. You know, it's something that that we turn to as a sexualized solution to what we were feeling or what we were dealing with in life. And and now we're still holding on to it. Mhm. Mm so essentially, um, if you if you have a, a little kid who, who has a pacifier, it's, it's understandable. Um, but at some point, they grow and mature to the point that they just put it down. It's not like it's not like they one one day decided, I'm never going to use the pacifier again, right? But they got to a point in their maturity and development where they just didn't need it anymore. And that's what I've experienced. And that's what I'm so passionate about helping other men experience is, is the sense of like, okay, I, I can put down the pacifier. I can let go of porn because I've made peace with it. And because I've grown emotionally, spiritually, sexually, um, 
in, in being able to regulate. Cause that's what a pacifier is. It's a regulator. Mm. Um, we often think of porn as a problem, which it is yet at a deeper level, it's a solution to the real problems that we're right. facing in life. And so like, I, I have new solutions. I have better solutions now that meet my real needs. Cause a pacifier, I mean, think about it. It's just, it's basically a fake nipple with no milk mm -hmm. and that's porn. You know, it's a fake nipple with no milk. Um, but we're, we're finding ways to get the nurture and nourishment that we may have never got before. Yeah. That's incredible. And I think one of the myths we were taught uh, as single Christian guys was you get married and then you can have sex and that will be, you know, that will be the real thing that you're, that you're looking for. Yeah. And what advice would you give to married guys who entered marriage with that mindset, as well as single guys who are still believing that mindset, that that's true. It doesn't matter how many times a married guy tells them it's not true. They're like, it'll be true for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. what, what do you say to them? Well, to the single guys, I want you to know that marriage will not solve whatever your sexual brokenness is. In fact, it will add to the stress and suffering. Yeah. Um, and by getting married, you will be passing that on to your wife as well. Because now there will not just be one person. There will be two people who are deeply affected by, by this pacifier that you're introducing into the marriage. Porn is actually not just a pacifier. It's also a predator. It's also abusive. And it's both. Um, so you're, you know, you're bringing a predator into the marriage and, mm. and, and viewing your spouse, if you're married, viewing your spouse as a replacement for porn or as an antidote against porn is actually incredibly dehumanizing and objectifying. Yeah. And I love the way you talk about that in beyond the battle. It, it's, it's not loving. You, you can lust after your spouse. Not all married sex is good. You know, yeah. we have this idea of like, okay, unmarried sex, bad, married sex, good. Um, there's a lot of married sex that, that is replicating pornography when it's just getting what I want and what I think I need and me being in control. Like that's a pornographic style of relating. I love, uh, Andrew Bauman's phrase, PSR, a pornographic style of relating. Mm -hmm. So a big part of recovery is learning and unlearning how we relate to people. Yeah. And that phrase, just let's, let's uh, kind of dive into that a little bit more. Cause I'll have guys say, well, I'm allowed to lust over my wife, you know? And I, th I think sometimes we just have different definitions of what lust is. I mean, you certainly can be attracted to your wife. You can look at your wife uh, and but you're, you're describing what you're describing is, is you're already kind of answering the question, but I, I think it's important. Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've consistently gotten that pushback uh, from, from guys and it, we, we, I, let me let you, let me let you kind of, uh, unpack that a little bit more for a guy that, that would say, uh, that might, let's just say might legitimately be confused on, well, goodness, am I allowed to like, look at my wife? Am I allowed to be attracted to my wife? Come on, give me something here. Right. Right. Sex is good. Sexuality is good. God created it for love, not for lust. So yeah. Lust is about taking and using. Love is about giving and receiving. Those are very different things. And it's really an internal heart posture. So you can be doing the same activity on the outside, but why? Is it an act of taking? Totally. Which yeah. is ultimately self-centered and self-absorbed? Or is it an act of giving and receiving? Not giving in order to get, that's manipulative, but Christ-like love. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. I've spent some time with Proverbs five because I had a guy. I, I don't remember where I was. It was a guy I didn't know. And he came up and asked me this question. And he used Proverbs five. Uh, and I'm going to paraphrase here because I'm just riffing on the podcast. But the verse about um, being, you know, he gets kind of detailed and about being um, intoxicated uh, with your wife and the, the wife of your youth um, ever being, may her breast satisfy you always, it says, like the uh, the wife of your youth. I'm kind of grabbing phrases here and there. 
And he, he said, look, it's, it's, it's right here. And what I've, it's been helpful in explaining to him and to myself and to other guys um, in that context that, um, first of all, it's like an older man writing this proverb and he's mm. talking about the wife of your youth. So he's not, the, his wife now isn't this, um, the, let me explain. It's the wife of his youth who's older now. So maybe they got married in their 20s and now they're in their 60s, okay? And he, what he's saying is, you need to be you should if you're if you're having sex out of love um that her breasts are going to satisfy you in the same way in her 60s that they would in their 20s and so what i've what i've done as a question for guys is um do you view your wife as like i love i'm just i'm going to try not to be too graphic here but like i love body parts okay i love these certain body parts and i must have them this is like the porn mindset i must mm -hmm. have these body parts uh, and the orgasm and feeling and all this stuff. And, and, and she is my God given, um, you know, set of those body parts. And so like, then in that sense, you've made vows to a thing, you've made vows to an object, uh, versus, and so you love body parts, right? Like, and that hasn't changed. And now you just happen to be married, uh, versus I love my wife. I love this person, this whole person, and there's so many good resources out there. Like I love, I always reference Matt and Lori Krieg's book, Impossible Marriage, because it's it's such a challenging book to straight couples on um, the need to cultivate intimacy in other areas than sex. Like for guys who think that's the only avenue of of intimacy, you're 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 probably not loving your wife as a whole person. So when you love your wife as a whole person then yeah, God's created sex and body parts and attraction. But the reason you enjoy it is not because you love body parts, it's because you love your wife. And she's the one that you experience that intimacy with, whether you're in your 20s or your 60s or beyond the way, which I think is really what the proverb uh, is talking about. Yeah. And I love how you highlighted the other areas of intimacy too, which are available to all of us, even if we're single, yeah. we're not married. Yeah, that's so big. Let me ask you some practical advice. I think for single guys who, you know, believe sex is meant for marriage and they're waiting and and you and I are both walking with guys, you know, or just, I think are frustrated, you know, God, why don't you provide this woman for me? Uh, or, or why do I have to be single? You know, these sorts of feelings. And, and I think they go two ways. One, there's a self-worth thing that we need to talk about. And then two, there is a practicality of it. I, I think in our culture, you mentioned video games um, in your, I played a lot of video games growing up too, but I'm 41. I think you're a little bit younger than me. And I'm, the video game revolution really, re I mean, I was in elementary school when the original Nintendo came out, NES, baby, 8-bit. Mm. Um, <laughs> I still own one of those and I still mm. play it for nostalgia. Uh, but, you know, nowadays it's like the, the games are all immersive. I mean, you could be a gamer and just spend hours and hours and hours of online gaming and and I, I think it's for guys, and there's a lot of, I'm sure, science and research behind why that's so appealing to men, particularly, and and what what you know what we might get out of that that sort of thing. Uh, but my question is, um, yeah, I, I see more and more guys isolating, and I I, I see married and single guys isolating. Um, so let's talk practically. If you're single. Um, how do you get your deeper desires and your needs met? Um, Cause it's not coming from watching YouTube for hours on end and, and playing video games, which I think is just such a default nowadays um, because of the cultural norms that we live in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Embodied brotherhood is celebrated in the Bible, Psalm 133, how good and pleasing it is for brothers to dwell together in unity and sisters, I would add. But so much of our communication and connection is happening online. It's disembodied. So I feel like there there is an important aspect of, of in-person experiences with the body of Christ. That's who we are as yeah as Christians. And I think there's something literal about that, where we represent Christ to each other um, through our hugs, through our tears, through listening. Um, and 
it's just being together. I mean, there is really a, a sharp decline in friendship, especially between men, which I am attempting to reverse as much as I can. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's just as simple as knowing some questions to ask. So I created this card deck called man cards and in it are 52 questions of varying levels of vulnerability. So like questions one through 10 are pretty surface level, but then you get to questions like 42 to 52, which are very deep and often sexually focused. So it's a way for guys to be able to choose how deep they want to go in a conversation and, and just have some structure around that. It's amazing to, to give some guys a set of man cards and then see where that conversation goes, because we, we just often don't really know how to develop a deeper friendship and, and that can be one way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. I, I think, um, and it takes intentionality to build these relationships, right? I think a lot of guys, men and women alike that are feeling isolated are passive thinking, why isn't anyone calling me? Uh, and and that's, you know, maybe they should, but why aren't you calling anybody? <laughs> like, I think yeah. we, we have to take initiative here and fight yeah. against the grain of the most individualistic culture that's ever existed um, yeah. and, and not stop, not quit or give up when it gets hard. Right. When, when well, I tried and it didn't work. So now I'm just going to go back to my isolation. Be the friend you long to have. And communities like Beyond the Battle and my community husband material that are focused on recovery yeah. are often creating a lot more vulnerability because people are sharing their deepest secrets. They're sharing things they've never told anyone before. That's right. So even if you don't identify with with a, a certain struggle, getting into a recovery type of community can can help you find those people who are willing to be real. Yeah, that is so so true. And uh, when when we um, when we get together in person, you know, we we do a lot of our online stuff online, like you guys do, right? Because you're you're all over the country and all over the world. But then when we do the retreats and things like that, we can see each other in person. And some of us local guys will hang out. And we encourage guys, right, to like it, it, it cements the bond that you're getting online. But it is amazing, even in that type of setting, being just what vulnerability can do, the power of vulnerability. Yeah. Um, it is, it's incredible the bonds that it can build uh, with guys that have just met and are only know each other online. And yeah, I, I sometimes when I'm talking to friends who aren't in a recovery community, uh, I feel bad for them. I feel bad that they don't have um, depth in their relationships and, you know, you invite them in, come join us. And they don't, you know, and, and, uh, and I just kind of wonder what baggage they're really carrying underneath. Um, and man, there's so many parallels. It's like, even if there's stuff we talk about, you know, this in your group, like, let's talk here in a minute. We'll talk about val value and identity and where we get our affirmation from, that is something every human being struggles with. And jump into a community that's talking about that. That's so important. So anyway, that's my that's my public service announcement to listeners to jump into a, a vulnerable community. Let me give a shout out. I did earlier on the intro, but uh, Crystal Renade and SheRecovery.com has a great community for women as well. Um, and this just applies to everybody and man, yeah, it's just, it's so important. And I, 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 I sometimes on a podcast like this, I, I just really want to highlight that to listeners because I don't want to see you suffering as a listener in isolation. And yet our whole culture is built to make you isolated. Even in marriage, isn't the solution to that either. Um, it, it's, it's, you could be you know, to be lonely in a marriage is almost worse than being lonely as a single person. Uh, and we, you know, but um, just, wow, it's, it's just really, yeah, it's really, really important. So <laughs> to not be isolated. Yeah. Uh, let's jump into the idea of trauma. So we're, um, you just came out with 10 ways to heal your trauma, resolving the roots of porn and sex addiction, which is a free resource uh, that people can check out husbandmaterial.com and you can find it there. 
Um, yeah, healyourtrauma.com as well. Healyourtrauma.com. Awesome. Yeah, I'll take you right there. Healyourtrauma.com. It's a great resource. Uh, let's just start with what is trauma and uh, kind of explain if there's different, are there different types of trauma? Are there different levels of trauma? I think some people know, yes, I've experienced trauma. Some people have experienced it and don't realize it. And some people would say, I haven't experienced any trauma. Yeah. Trauma is the result of living outside of the Garden of Eden. We all carry in our bodies and in our souls experiences that have shaped us, suffering that that was not just a difficult experience, but but places where we get stuck. Fear, shame, and loss are, are not just felt by some people. We all feel it. And we develop different ways to cope, to survive. So in our context, sexual stimulation is one of the most common false saviors that can can help us get through overwhelming situations, times when we have felt alone, powerless. And so trauma can be both the the bad things that that happen to us that are not processed it can also be the absence of of the good things that we didn't receive some people talk about like big t trauma and little t trauma but i don't like that because it actually like ranks and judges mm. our experiences one maybe less judgmental way to say it would be acute trauma of like an event like a car crash or a death versus chronic trauma which was just the air that I breathed as a kid. Maybe it was the air of constantly being criticized, feeling like a disappointment. Maybe it was the air I breathed of just coming home every day after school to a big empty house where I was alone. That's That was my story. And, and so trauma can look all different ways. The big difference is Whatever you have suffered, whatever you've been through in your life, was it processed? Mm -hmm. Was it digested? Because if in the moment I feel like my dad's really disappointed in me, and then we have a repair experience where he's like, my son, I love you so much. Even if you get bad grades in school, even if uh, you never win a game in the sport that you're playing no matter what you do, I still love you. If if we have that kind of experience, then the disappointment doesn't stick. I don't get stuck there. Um, but trauma is really the, the stuff that was not processed. So it actually doesn't depend on how extreme or painful your experience was. The question is, is it still with you? Yeah. Mm. And that's, that's what we need to deal with. And you mentioned middle school or earlier as part of your story. And I, I think often with trauma too, we think of our parents and certainly, yeah, there's those acute abuses that can happen. There's sexual abuse that happens. Uh, there's there's anger abuse that happens, but there's also trauma that we pick up from middle school. We pick up from our peer groups uh, and on into high school. And I think a lot of times that goes unchecked, like, oh, that's just part of that's just part of being in school. And yet we've experienced a lot of trauma, a lot of rejection, a lot of fill in the blank. Right. And that's, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So going back to bullying in my community, 89% of men said that they have experienced bullying. These are guys who struggle with porn and unwanted sexual behavior. I think there's a huge correlation there. Mm. Now, in our lives today, if if I'm at work and my boss gives me some negative feedback about something or some ways I can prove, there might be a part of me that doesn't just feel like, oh, he's, you know, he's giving me some some difficult advice, but I feel devastated. I can't stop thinking about it. Um, when when my reaction feels feels bigger than the situation or disproportionate, it's a clue that maybe mm. 
maybe that 13 year old boy is getting triggered, is getting activated. Our triggers reveal our trauma. And so both in, in the emotional pain that we, that we experience that feels overwhelming in the sexual pleasure that feels irresistible. All of that is a trailhead. It's leading us back to those places where we got stuck. So I'm 32 years old, but there's a part of me that still feels six. There's a part of me that still feels 15. And, and so a lot of healing our trauma means allowing all of those parts of us to have a voice, to have a choice, to not being alone and, and to experience Jesus. Mm. Yeah. Talk about that piece. As we talk about how to heal our trauma, I think you have these two extremes. Uh, one, Jesus is just like pixie dust, you know, we'll pray this away in, in kind of it's um, we're just not going to get below the surface. Maybe they're not two extremes. I just think if, if Jesus is involved, I think it, people think, um, well, what does that have to do with, with my trauma? Right. At, at all. I think there's a, there's a disconnect between, um, these two things, or if Jesus is involved in sort of the, the method, uh, then, then yeah, it's kind of like a Sunday school pixie dust. Um, here's some verses kind of this old, it's just magic or, um, it almost dismisses, it's kind of dismissive about, about what's going on. And I could almost see someone rolling their eyes a little bit, but, uh, but you and I both believe Jesus is at the core, the foundation of try, you know, finding true healing from this. Um, and it's in the gospel, but it's, it's a deeper gospel than just, um, Hey, you're forgiven of your sins. Mm-hmm. Um, if you ask Jesus to forgive your sins, he does, and you're going to heaven. Um, amen to that. Uh, and there, but there's so much more, uh, that, and, and it ties into this, this healing journey. So how would you weave, how would you incorporate, maybe not weave, but just what role does Jesus play in someone's mm-hmm. healing from their trauma? Well, oftentimes those of us who are having an attachment to porn or some kind of struggle that we just can't get over, we we know intellectually the truth that God loves us or the truth that my identity is in Christ but we just don't experience it. And people often talk about this gap between my head and my heart. Another way to say that might be the gap between your logical left brain and your more emotional right brain in in a sense that, that there's something missing, like knowing the truth cognitively is only going to get you so far. So how does Jesus interact with our trauma? It's it's not just by saying some nice things. We need to have an experience of Jesus with us in whatever it is that we're going through or that, um, that has been done to us. And that can happen in, in so many different ways. I think the 10 ways to heal your trauma document goes into a lot of how that can happen. But essentially, I mean, trauma is not just uh, suffering or pain. It's the sense of being alone and powerless in whatever it is. So being able to invite Jesus into those moments, whether um, physically or just in your imagination or, or with a group of people who are laying hands on your shoulders and and groaning with you. I mean, being able to, to have a new experience where I'm not alone in this. And and Jesus is with me. Mm. And and he, and with him, I am not powerless. Yeah. Um, and that changes everything. And it's not like a one-time magical formula, but really having these healing experiences can can reconnect our head and our heart they can integrate both sides of our brain so that um, going forward god doesn't feel far away he feels right here mm mm-hmm, mhm mhm yeah so i'm going to keep jesus or in hand here and then can can you 
describe maybe a, some options, a list maybe of a guy that's struggling with porn, a guy that's looking at porn. What mm-hmm. are uh, what are because because this is in the PDF, so I'm, I'm mm-hmm. kind of referencing that. But just what are some ways he might be thinking about himself, his sense of value, his his lack of value, right, his lack of worth. What are what are some some things he might be telling himself or believing about himself, and then and then contrast that with um, again hanging on to Jesus as we were talking about. Um, what's actually true about him that that he's not has not yet been able to. Um, maybe to, to, to believe. Yeah. I mean, common lies that we believe about ourselves are, I'm not good enough, not worthy of love. I'm alone. I'm unlovable. You know, if people really knew me, they wouldn't love me. I can't depend on anyone else. I have to be in charge of meeting my own needs. If, if I'm really honest, I won't be taken care of. I'm ugly. I'm worthless. I'm hopeless. I'm always going to struggle with this. I mean, even as I say that, I realize it's not primarily up here. Like mm-hmm. I feel that in my chest. Yeah. It it's it's deep in my bones. And so we need to find a way to access not just, you know, what are those lies, but what are the experiences that those lies are based on? And then have a redemptive experience that disproves those lies. And I'm just going to take that in the most simple and powerful way that, that we both facilitate in our groups. When a guy says something that he's never told anyone before, Mm -hmm. a secret that he's kept to himself for years, if not decades, opens up to a group and then he's met with nothing but compassion, kindness, acceptance, and love. If you're in person, everybody comes around and gives them a big hug. That changes your body yeah, at a cellular level. Um, it's amazing. So being able to do that, first of all, requires a, a safe context where you can open up about this stuff. And secondly, it takes a lot of courage. And then hopefully with wise guides, trusted leaders, uh, people who are, are trained in some of these different ways to heal your trauma, you, you can come away with hope. <laughs> not, that, not that all struggles will be taken away, but that like, there, there is a way forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and as we and as we take those redemptive risks and and those lies begin to to deteriorate in their power over us you know we can we can point back to some of those experiences and say no i know i'm loved i know i'm not alone cuz look these guys in all in all of their mess they proved that that i don't have to be the one to always take care of myself mm that's so good. And it really ties in with some of what we talked about earlier, where that that has to be done in community, right? Where mm-hmm. I, I think that's where that's a that was a growth step I had to take as a um even as a as a someone facilitating and writing about this stuff is I um I I believe Jesus I believed Jesus and still believe Jesus is the solution to what these desires that we have, that yeah. the affirmation that we're looking for from women or from sex or from porn is affirmation that we can only get met in Jesus at the deepest level, that those true messages about who we are are from Jesus. And so even in the first edition of my book, I really emphasized that and consolidating a lot of my story Um uh, things changed in the second edition of the book where, uh, I realized, um, I had been neglecting my own, as you called it, um, uh, I called it vulnerable community. I think you said embodied brotherhood. Is that right? Yeah. 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 I had been neglecting my own embodied brotherhood, my own vulnerable community, and it wasn't intentional, but I, I, I had, I had stopped having that for myself and in doing so, man, you 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 quickly um, 
you lose the the embodiment of the love of Jesus in yes. in your life. And I mean, what we believe is that as we experience this love and acceptance and affirmation from other guys, we are experiencing the love and affirmation of Jesus in in the flesh, like in in bodily form. And, and that is, as you mentioned, I mean, it literally is what's healing our brains. It's literally yeah. healing the trauma in our life because we're experiencing it. Like you said, where it's, it's proving it, it's proving yes. it over and over again yeah. to those lies. And man, you just, you need that community. You need, um, in our case, other men who are affirming us with the love that Jesus has for us. Yes. And this is so different than attacking, avoiding, or ignoring. This goes back to that befriending with Jesus, with others, and within myself. Because it's not the mature adult me who's still struggling with some of these things. It's the little boy. Mm. And there's no contradiction between the idea that Jesus is the one healing me and also some of these different processes can be healing me. He uses all of these things. If we look at the Gospels, Jesus healed people in some crazy ways, like spitting in the ground and rubbing mud in somebody's eyes. And for somebody else, he doesn't even say anything. They're just healed miles away. Um, like so many ways that Jesus can heal, so many ways that his truth can set us free. It, it's not just um, one way. There are so many ways, and, and there are even more than 10 ways to heal your trauma. But the point is, we can we can be excited to learn what those ways are that he has he has created, that that he's he's made this amazing world. And we don't have to be afraid of of learning about some of these things like EMDR or brain spotting or polyvagal theory. I mean, all that stuff was created by God. And and so rather than just focusing on spirituality only. Let's take into account what what we can learn from science and what we can learn from um, unexpected and yet really powerful um, experiences that that some of us might be skeptical about, and that's okay. There's also not one way that just works for everybody. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you this um, in the context of this conversation before we wrap up. Does this... Um, do these types of communities apply to guys that are attracted to other guys, guys that are attracted to the same sex? What is, what's your, what's your invitation to them that might be listening um, when yeah. it comes to an invitation into the types of communities that you and I are leading? Oftentimes, uh, attachment to porn featuring the same sex, let's just say for men, is based on a fear of other men, a shame about themselves as a man, and a lack of connection with other men. So underneath the attractions, there are these experiences of fear, shame, and loss. Now, safety is important. And there are some men who use these recovery communities as a pretense for finding partners to sexually act out with. And so we need to be careful and cautious, not just trust everybody or be vulnerable with anybody. Um, but within a safe environment, like what you and I are creating, we can find appropriate ways to meet those deeper needs. Mm -hmm. And it's not unique necessarily to SSA guys. I mean, we all need the same sex. Brotherhood is not more necessary for some of us. It's necessary for all of us. Yeah. But for some of us, the way that we have sexualized our desires goes in different directions. And, and underneath it all, there, there are these same core experiences that we're all healing together. Mm -hmm. And so I, I love it when, when I see in my community and in your community as well, it, it's not just for, for one type of guy. It's like everybody is welcome here. And, and hopefully we're creating a space which provides both protection and connection. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. And I, 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 uh, 
I just think it's so important. And even for our straight guys, you know, to hear that, that that's, this is for, we're all in the same boat, you know, in, in the sense that, and I think it can be helpful to expand it out even beyond sexual ways of getting these needs met to just as a pastor, I'm preaching, you know, every week and look like this might not be your thing, but you, something is there, there's something you're going to as a pacifier it, it, to, to get these needs met for validation, these needs met for affirmation. And there's stuff from your past that created that need. And yeah. this is your pacifier. And it might be things that the world looks at as, or the church even looks at as, as good things. It could be success. It could be, yeah. uh, it could be accolades. It could be money and you're, safety, security, and you're chasing this stuff. And meanwhile, we're all actually in the same boat. We all actually need Jesus to be the one that that meets these needs. And we need vulnerable community to be to meet us with the truth about who we are. And so I like to talk about, and I think Paul does that with the way he lists all these sins out, and he doesn't put one above another. Uh, he just says, look, we all need Jesus, you know? And so um, I just have seen some great healing and beyond the battle with guys that are attracted to the same sex. And I know you've seen some really incredible healing oh, yeah. um, in guys attracted to the same sex and husband material. And so I just right. think, uh, I think that's really important that we create a safe space um, for all of us that are saying, Hey, look, I, I want to follow Jesus. I'm broken. Nobody's more broken than another person. Can yeah. we, can we follow Jesus together? And again, um, show grace to each other. When, when you share your story, I'm going to love you. I'm going to accept you. I'm going to put my arms around you uh, because that's what grace is. And we all need grace. Amen. So, yeah. Yeah. And healing doesn't necessarily mean that the attractions will change or be removed or be replaced, but rather that they no longer are controlling us. Mm -hmm. they've lost their power because Jesus has not only saved me from my sin, but from these other saviors. Yeah. And, and so when we find our, our true desires met, then we simply, we simply don't need the counterfeits. That's it right there. Yeah. Yeah. The true desire is met and it may not change. And I get it. I mean, I, I even like straight single guys praying, God, give me a spouse, give me a mm -hmm. wife, give me a wife. And for same sex attracted guys who I'm sure have prayed millions of prayers, change my attraction, change my attraction, change my attraction. And um, yet when um, the le leaders in the in, in that community that are writing books on this stuff and people I've interviewed on my podcast before pe people can go back and listen to, there's a common theme and it's when I got that deepest need for intimacy mm -hmm. met in Jesus. Um, the attraction didn't go away, but the, my need was met. It was like my, my, my need was met. And, and I, yeah. I think there's, um, right. it's uh, jump in on that. Yeah, go ahead. Well, it, it empowers me to be with my attraction, not to be my attraction or to be yeah. controlled by it. And also yeah. not to be like trying to kill it, you yeah. know? And I think that goes for our emotions too. Instead of just being angry, I can be with my anger. Instead of just being lonely, I can be with my loneliness and invite Jesus into that place. Invite other men, other people into that place. I mean, so much healing comes from the withness, you know. And and that that is so core to who we are. We are created for connection, for attachment. And so, in order to detach from porn, detach from some of these patterns we need to receive a superior attachment. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, that's so good. Uh, let's wrap up with this. Um, two, two things, uh, tools and resources that you'd want to direct guys to. And then just a, just a last word uh, for listeners, listeners kind of listening from uh, all over the place, some that are deep in this struggle, some that aren't, uh, just, just the last word that you want uh, people mm. to hear to kind of wrap up our conversation. Okay. You can find free courses, private community, and uh, a host of 
of amazing men who are on the same journey at husbandmaterial.com, including the new Heal Your Trauma course. And my last word to all the men is that you are God's beloved son. In you, he is well pleased. He is overjoyed, thrilled. He is beside himself to be yours and that you are his. That's who you are. What we do doesn't change it one way or the other, but we're learning to live in alignment with that truth. And to the women, you are God's beloved daughter. And in you, he is well pleased. That's how I end every episode of my podcast. Amen to that. We uh, we at our Zoom alumni, that's our, a guy will share his, how his week was going and and uh, and then a guy will, will give him what we call it our father's blessing and mm. just reads pretty much exactly what you just said over him. Yeah. So I love it. I just, and uh, talk about rituals, like good rituals. Mm -hmm. I hear that in my head during the week because I hear it every Saturday morning. And as you say it, I just light up I'm like, yeah. It's another reminder, right? It's another proof um, of truth about who I am. And um, it's just a beautiful, when we really can meditate on that truth, it is really beautiful. So thank you for ending this episode of the of the flip side with that truth, Drew. And that is so true uh, for listeners. So um, yeah, thanks, man. This has been great. And uh, listeners, I uh, encourage you to check out uh, the husbandmaterial.com. There's tons of free resources there. And then there is also tons of great groups and just uh, so many, so many options um, to check out. So Drew, thanks for your work. Thanks for your vulnerability. And uh, thanks for sharing that here with our audience today. Thanks, Noah. All right, welcome back again. A huge takeaway uh, for me from that interview, just for, for listeners, please don't try to do this alone. You don't have to do this alone. Uh, find, and, and one thing I, I, I meant to mention in the conversation with Drew, I think it's so important to have structured, regular community. I think often we go, oh, I've got this friend I talk to when I need to. And I would ask, how often do you really talk to that friend? You know, if it's random, it's probably every six months. Who knows how often you're actually talking to them. And in doing so, I don't think you get the real value of accountability and regular uh, regular embodied community that you need. So make it structured, make it intentional where you are gathering around these truths and around these questions. And so highly recommend you check out husbandmaterial.com, which is a place that you can find that. You also can find it at myministrybeyondthebattle.net. You also can do both. I think uh, so many of these recovery ministries are so good and are supplemental to one another. Uh, but I'd, I'd love for you to jump into a seven-week group with me at beyondthebattle.net and then jump into our alumni community. Uh, the alumni community is free and ongoing. And then check out Husband Material. Drew's got all kinds of great free resources over there, uh, as well as his Husband Material Academy. And for ladies, again, check out sherecovery.com. I also want to make sure that I mention, again, I don't think these are the ultimate solution. Uh, the ultimate solution is, is found in what Drew and I were just talking about, getting the deeper desires met. But I just we need to be really honest. This is an addiction. And when you can, when you can stop pornography from even entering into your space, uh, it, is, it is really getting you ahead of the game. Or if you're a parent who has kids and you are trying to limit and or eliminate their exposure to pornography, I highly recommend both Covenant Eyes and Accountable to You. Every single episode of The Flip Side, if you go to the show notes, we have promo codes for both for you to get a free month of Covenant Eyes and Accountable to You. So check those out. Uh, the Covenant Eyes one is covenanteyes.com, promo code BEYOND, and the Accountable to You uh, one is a2u.app slash beyond. Again, check those out in the show notes. Um, but so, so helpful. I think to do the deeper work, um, sometimes, often, 
and again, just uh, I, I don't even want to be apologetic about it. I use this software. It, it really helps get your head into a clear space where you then can do the deeper work without being constantly bombarded with more and more temptation. It also ups the level of uh, vulnerable community because you're, you're being held accountable by people that love you and that you're in community with. You're already having these conversations with. So thanks for listening. Uh, if the show is a blessing to you, if the show is helping you in your walk and you are able to, uh, please join our Patreon support team who is making this show possible, making this ministry possible, patreon.com slash Noah Philippiak. And huge shout out and thanks to all of you that are already supporting. Pick up your copy of Needed Navigation today. Pick up a copy for your youth pastors Pick up a copy for teenagers that you know, and honestly, read it yourself. If you're someone who connected with this material, perhaps you've already read Beyond the Battle. Needed Navigation is all brand new material. Yes, it's written to teenagers, but there is so much stuff that's going to apply to you as an adult as well. And it's a quick, easy read. So I highly encourage you to pick it up. Uh, even as a sequel, so to speak, to, uh, to be on the battle. So thanks for your support. Thanks for reading. Thanks for listening. And I will see you next time on The Flip Side. The Flip Side with Noah Philippiak is a Beyond Ministries production. Copyright Noah Philippiak. www.noahphilippiak.com Theme music by Kyle Lake at K Lake Music. Used with permission. Please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and subscribe wherever podcasts are found. When I finish, it's time to bring me closer. There's no purgatory because you're in or you're out. When you see them in the clouds, then you know it's going down. Raise them, raise them, raise them. They've been sleeping for some ages. Now all God's babies so confused by this hatred. Pulpit preachers shouldn't aim to be A-list. Money probably long, but.